On the morning of June 17, 2021, the good people of Minneapolis, Minnesota, awoke to a series of grisly discoveries. Scattered across the northeastern neighborhood of St. Anthony West were a number of partially stuffed trash bags. They were found on sidewalks, on front lawns, in driveways, and on park benches, and they quickly became the subject of equal parts irritation and curiosity. One by one, calls began to trickle in to the city's emergency dispatchers as concerned citizens started to investigate the trash bags and uncover their contents. To the horror of the curious, they discovered that each of the bags contained the butchered pieces of a human being. Within the hour, Minneapolis emergency services received another grim phone call. A member of the public reported that pieces of a human leg had been scattered outside the city's Ukrainian-American community center. It became quite clear that whoever was responsible wanted all of these pieces to be found. And yet, as the day went on, it also became evident that one significant part of the body was missing. The head. Less than a week later, as the Minneapolis Police Department continued to puzzle over the victim's identity, an early morning jogger made yet another horrifying discovery. Just before 6.45 am, the jogger was making their way down a paved trail on the bank of the Mississippi River when they spotted something resting on a park bench. At a distance, it wasn't clear what the object was, but upon closer inspection, they realized that it was a frozen human head. One with the letters P E R V carved into the cold flesh of its forehead. A clear message, if ever there was one. Forensic investigators quickly determined that the head was the missing piece of the dismembered body found scattered throughout St. Anthony West, and that prior to being left on the bench, it had been kept in a freezer. With facial and dental recognition now available, Law enforcement discovered that the victim was a 36-year-old man named Adam Johnson. Adam was unemployed, had a history of mental illness and substance abuse, and was of no fixed address at the time he perished. He was clearly a troubled man, but saying that, he was well liked in the community and seemed determined to better himself. Adam had apparently tried to check into a wellness center just a few days before his untimely end and toxicology reports showed that he was clean at the time his life was taken. It seems he was denied a place at whatever rehab centers he applied for, most likely due to overcrowding. By October 2021, the investigation into Adam's slaying had so badly stagnated that the Minneapolis Police Department sought the assistance of the FBI. Investigators worked silently, paying no credence to the rumors that swirled in the local newspapers rumors of organized crime being involved in some way. Despite their best efforts, FBI agents seemed to make little progress in unmasking the man responsible. But although the identity of the killer still remains a mystery to this very day, Adam's past history may well reveal a clue as to their motive. In 2008, Adam was convicted of, quote, malicious punishment of a child. Minnesota law defines that as cruel, excessive discipline inflicted upon a minor, and those found guilty can expect up to 10 years imprisonment and a fine of $20,000. That sounds deplorable, and it certainly is, but it's important to note that the crime's restricted to acts of corporal punishment, and is distinct from any other type of nefarious activity involving minors. However, it's possible that some overzealous vigilante mistook what malicious punishment means and, believing that Adam had actually done something worse to a kid, decided to deal out some capital justice with a capital P-E-R-V. That's one theory. Another is that this was all a case of mistaken identity. You see, another man, who also happened to be named Adam Johnson, was born in the English port city of Sunderland on July 14th, 1987 making him roughly the same age as his American counterpart. The two men also shared a passing resemblance. And much like Adam from Minnesota, Adam from the UK also had a run-in with the law involving the treatment of children. Only, instead of just giving them a hard slap, 
UK Adam had engaged in far more sinister activities. At the time, this UK Adam was a fairly successful pro footballer, whose career was going from strength to strength. After spells at Middlesbrough and Manchester City, British Adam signed for his boyhood club, Sunderland AFC, for a fee of £10 million. In December of 2014, UK Adam began a series of online communications with a 15-year-old female fan. A month later, he arranged to meet up with her in a secluded car park. Adam gave the girl two signed football jerseys, and the pair parted without any further incident. To any observers, the interaction might have appeared odd, but maybe innocent. In reality, this meeting served as a dry run for a second rendezvous one where Adam would unveil far more unsavoury intentions. Just under two weeks after their initial meeting, UK Adam and the girl met yet again in the same secluded spot. It was then that he coerced the girl into performing some deeply inappropriate, intimate acts. A month later, he was arrested by Durham Police and was officially charged on April 23rd. At his trial, he pled guilty and was sentenced to six years behind bars. A light sentence, but it gets worse. He was actually released in March of 2019, after completing just half of that time. Although they lived almost 4,000 miles apart, someone may have met Minnesota Adam Johnson, quickly Google searched his name, saw the news headlines along with the photos that resembled him, and, blinded by a desire for real justice, they took his life and butchered him before exhibiting their handiwork to as wide an audience as possible. That might sound far-fetched, but as we've come to hear on this channel, far stranger things have happened. Then again, perhaps Minnesota Adam had simply messed up with the wrong person at the wrong time. As mentioned, he suffered from mental illness, and had been in and out of jail for numerous issues related to it. For instance, he had been arrested for hurling feces at transit workers during a psychological episode. He had battled with his issues for a long time, and had been working hard to get better. In the words of his former partner, Jojo, When he's doing fantastic and doing great, he's a wonderful person. And when he struggles, he really struggles. It does and has ended up in trouble. With that in mind, could Adam have ended up in trouble with a truly disturbed person? The type of person capable of slicing a man into pieces and scattering him across town? the type of person willing to store their victim's head in their freezer for a week. Perhaps. Speculation aside, the fact remains that we'll never truly know what happened to Minnesota and Adam until whoever took his life is caught. And at present, the state of the investigation is far from promising. His family have complained that the Minneapolis Police Department have shown little interest in finding his killer and that a lack of coordination between state and federal authorities has resulted in a complete collapse of the investigation. All they have left is unanswered questions. I drive myself crazy thinking about how it happened, said Jojo. But that's something that I have to think about, because this is our reality. This was somebody who knew him. They knew what they were doing, and they knew how to do it. It's chilling to hear someone speak of Adam's death in such a way, especially someone so close to him. Adam's past history is a matter of public record. Anyone can look it up, and it's almost certain that his slayer did too. After all, what else could have motivated them to carve the letters P-E-R-B into his head? A head which they then displayed on a public bench, as if they were proud of themselves. As if they had done society a service. Seven-year-old Jody Husentrude had a bright future in TV news. But on June 27, 1995, the hopes and dreams of the hometown TV anchor mysteriously faded to black. Then that's more tragic. There's a lot to think about here. Yeah. I really shouldn't say this phrase out because they don't want to you know. Jody Husentrude was born on June 5, 1968, in the small town of Long Prairie, Minnesota, the youngest daughter of Maurice and Imogen Husentrude. In high school, Jody was an excellent golfer, winning back-to-back -back state tournaments in 1985 and 1986. Following her graduation, 
She went on to study mass communications and speech communication at Minnesota's St. Cloud State University. After securing her degree, Jody briefly worked for Northwest Airlines, but soon began a broadcasting career with a CBS affiliate in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. After a brief spell as the station's bureau chief, Jody began working for Mason City's CBS affiliate, and by June of 1995, she was happy, successful, and well on her way to bigger and better things. Yet, shortly after a golf tournament in late June of 1995, Jody seemed to drop off the face of the earth, and what followed has resulted in a deep and enduring mystery. Jody was expected to arrive at work around 4am on Tuesday, June 27th, but after she failed to show up, producer Amy Coons decided to call her at home. After an extended ring, Jody picked up the phone and apologised to Amy before explaining that she had simply overslept. Before hanging up, Jody assured her producer that she was just about to leave home and that she had arrived at the TV station as soon as possible for her 6am show. When Amy had to fill in for Jodie's 6am morning show, people began to worry. And when 7am came and went, staff at KIMT contacted the Mason City Police Department and asked them to check up on her. When a pair of police officers arrived at Jodie's apartment building, they found that her red Mazda Miata was still in the parking lot. On the ground next to her car were some of Jodie's personal effects, including her purse, some makeup, one of her red high heels, her hairdryer, and her car key. There was evidence that some kind of struggle had occurred, such as a drag mark near her vehicle. The thick steel of Jodie's car key had also been bent. That not only suggested that someone had rushed her while she was opening or starting her car, but that her attacker was extremely strong. An unidentified palm print present on Jodie's car was believed to belong to whoever that individual was. Detectives questioned Jody's neighbours regarding her disappearance. Three of them reported hearing screams coming from the car park around the time that Jody went missing, but none of them bothered to call the authorities. Another neighbour recalled seeing a suspicious white van in the building's parking lot shortly before Jody vanished, with its lights on and its engine running. Sadly, this vehicle has never been positively traced. Jody's co-workers suggested that an obsessed fan may have been responsible for taking her. Nine months prior, Jody confided in them that a black van had been following her while she was out jogging. A pattern of false leads and dead ends repeated itself throughout the investigation, until finally the authorities announced that they were diverting resources away from Jody's case. Frustrated by that announcement, her family opted to hire a private investigation team in September of 1995. They enlisted the services of the nationally renowned McCarthy and Associates Investigation Services, who flew Jody's family out to Los Angeles to meet with three prominent psychics. This meeting was filmed in front of a live studio audience and served as the pilot for a TV show titled Psychic Detectives. Unsurprisingly, none of the so-called psychics helped advance the investigation. As such, Jody's parents commissioned a large-scale, intensive search of Cerro Gordo County in May of 1996, one which involved over a hundred search and rescue personnel. The teams worked hard to uncover clues, making use of cutting-edge tracking and surveillance techniques. Sadly, no promising evidence was recovered. In June of 2008, 13 years after she had gone missing, Photocopies of the 84 pages of Jody's personal journal were anonymously mailed to a local newspaper. The original journal had been in the possession of law enforcement since the investigation began, so obviously someone within the police department had leaked them. Within days, they discovered that the sender was the wife of the former Mason City police chief, who had taken a copy of the journal home when he left office. Police gave no motive as to why the woman had mailed photocopies of the journal to the newspaper, and she has since declined to state her reasons. We can only speculate as to whether the journal contained any significant information which she wanted revealed to the public, or if she simply wanted to revive the investigation.
we should come back. I really do. What do we know about John Van Sykes? In 1994, he was divorced. After the divorce, John moved to Mason City. His address was the key apartment. Ski and Jody were neighbors and became good friends. I think she was spending more time with, with John than she was with really anyone. In March of 2017, a search warrant was brought against a man named John Van Sys, who was apparently the last person to see Jody alive. He'd visited her apartment the night before she disappeared, where the pair reportedly watched a videotape of Jody's 27th birthday party together. Jody and John were close, with John himself stating, quote, Jody was like a daughter to me. She was just like my own child. Some theorize that John may have stayed the night at Jody's, hence why she was running late for work the day she went missing. Police later seized GPS devices from two of John's vehicles, but have remained tight-lipped ever since. Another person of interest in the case is Tony Jackson, a convicted rapist who was living just two blocks away from Jody's workplace when she vanished. A former cellmate of his would later state that Tony had written rap lyrics indicating he was the culprit, and that Jody was buried near a farm silo in Tiffin, Iowa. That being said, no forensic evidence has ever linked Tony Jackson to the case. It's been 27 years since that fateful day in 1995, meaning that Jody Husendrut has been missing for as many years as she was alive. Despite being declared legally dead in 2001, Minnesota TV journalists Josh Benson and Gary Peterson created the website findjody.com in 2003. The goal of the website is to keep the search for Jody active, and recently, Josh and Gary launched a podcast in hopes of gaining a new audience with which to share information and generate new leads. There might be little hope for bringing Jody home alive and well, but there's still plenty to suggest that her killer could face justice sooner rather than later. Back in August of 2006, 79-year-old fire spotter Stephanie Stewart was stationed up at the Athabasca Fire Lookout Point in the Canadian province of Alberta. There are many such lookout points in the province, and each plays a crucial role in the prevention of destructive forest fires. The Athabasca Lookout is perhaps one of the more significant stations, as it overlooks the wildfire-plagued Tonkin Valley. If any flames were to get out of control in Tonkin, the nearby town of Hinton would be in serious danger, hence why Stephanie's job was so important. Generally speaking, the lookout points are inhabited by a single, solitary scout, who lives out in the woods full-time from late spring until early autumn. It makes for a gruelling task, fit only for the most mentally and physically capable. Yet despite her age, Stephanie was a hardened outdoorswoman, she was healthy and adventurous, having cycled solo across Canada and climbing Mount Kilimanjaro in her 60s. She was also a veteran of the lookout point, and had been volunteering to serve up there for the past 13 years. It was a tough job, but Stephanie adored it, saying it gave her time to indulge in her two favourite pastimes, reading and gardening. She was a diligent worker, who called into head office three times a day to make her reports, so, when Stephanie failed to call in the morning weather report on August 26th, those who knew her were gravely concerned. She had last been heard from at 9pm the previous evening, when she chatted on the phone to a family member. A handful of rangers were sent to do a welfare check on her. What they found was deeply unsettling. When the rangers entered Stephanie's small cabin, they discovered the place was completely deserted, a pot of water sat simmering on the stove, meaning Stephanie hadn't been gone for very long, and since her grey pickup truck was still parked outside, she could have only departed on foot. The rangers initially found those signs encouraging, but just moments later, when they discovered spots of blood on the stairs of the cabin's porch, they began to fear the worst. There was enough blood to suggest that the woman was no longer alive. Following an intensive search of the cabin, it was discovered that two pillows, a bedsheet, a comforter, and a gold watch had been taken. But while robbery remained an obvious motive, 
investigators decided to dig deeper. A fish and game conservation officer was consulted regarding the possibility that Stephanie had fallen victim to some kind of animal attack. Yet, following an intensive analysis of the area, no animal hair, prints or scat were found, and they were forced to rule the possibility out. It was announced that Stephanie had most likely been forcibly taken by someone and killed. The general search effort would continue, but the prognosis was a grim one. At one point, the police raised the possibility that a man named Travis Vader was the one to blame for Stephanie's disappearance. Vader had previous convictions for arson, theft, and weapons charges, and was later sentenced to life in 2010 for taking the lives of Lal and Marie McCann, a couple in their 70s who disappeared during a camping trip in British Columbia. Vader slaughtered the McCanns following a chance encounter with them west of Edmonton. After disposing of their bodies in some nearby woods, he set their RV alight and went on the run. Vader had not only committed similar crimes before, but he was actually in the region of the Athabasca Fire lookout point when Stephanie went missing. Yet despite the circumstantial evidence, no concrete connection has ever been established between Vader and Stephanie's case, and he's yet to be formally charged. Vader has continually denied any involvement in Stephanie's disappearance. Although the continued search effort kept hopes alive, the search teams were faced with a number of problems. Hinton is surrounded by wilderness, with dense forest and steep hillsides extending for almost hundreds of miles in every direction. There's not a single other town within 80 kilometers of the place. Which raised the question, if Stephanie was taken, where exactly did her captor take her to? The search quickly expanded from the area surrounding the lookout point to one of the largest foot searches in the province's history, and was joined by specialized aircraft which scoured over 7,500 square kilometers for any sign of the missing woman. This gargantuan effort persisted until late October, when winter conditions forced the search teams to temporarily abandon their mission. The following summer, the search resumed. But sadly, no trace of Stephanie was ever found. In the years that have followed this terrifying and mysterious disappearance, Alberta's Fire Lookout Organization implemented a number of safety procedures, each designed to prevent such an incident reoccurring. These days, all potential lookouts undergo a brief but intensive course in self-defense, and enjoy a number of advanced safety features at all of their sites. These include better fencing, more lighting, and panic buttons to summon aid as quickly as possible. Sadly, these changes will never bring Stephanie Stewart back, and by the looks of it, neither will the efforts of missing persons investigators. Despite the use of improved DNA analysis and additional widespread searches of the area, authorities are no closer to solving Stephanie's disappearance than they were back in 2006. Whoever took Stephanie had no means of transporting her body except on foot. No other vehicle tracks were ever found near the tower, and her own vehicle remained untouched. That means that unless the search teams overlook something during their long and intensive search, Stephanie's captor carried her, dead or alive, for hundreds of miles before disposing of her. The thought of Stephanie's killer possessing such strength and stamina is truly frightening, and leaves us wondering if there's more to this story than meets the eye. Hey guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. I'd like to say a huge thank you to Sam Riding for writing the script for this episode, and also a big thank you to all of my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon, especially my biggest supporters. Jacqueline Guevara Phelan, Shauna Geisler, Lloyd Thomas, Peyton Trolling, Itai Alum, Torpid Chair 1139, Nephus 1988, Lydia Cumo, The Deck of Cards, Mrs. Avon Rankin, Brad Hammer 33, Zane, The Only Dorita, Taylor and Monica Gruenk, Philip Wester, Peter Logdraj, Monica Mendoza, Lyndon Witebski, Leonardo Martinez, J.B. Funk, Infamous Sempapi, Ian Billock, Grace Archie, Gina Valera, George Lopez, 
Dustin and Tiffany Vanderpool, Dupsy, Connor Lotham, Colin Monsma, Chief Kochuake, Azrael Warakai, Asia Mina, Anya Yekaterina Faustov, Alex Greensall, Clayton Thompson, and Jesse Juck. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. The best things happen. In the dark.